back to the John of the Eighth chapter and we'll look at one verse this morning and then we'll be done with John chapter 8. For several weeks we have been studying this passage going through the Gospel of John on Sunday morning. And it describes a very intense and a determined attack by religious people against the Lord Jesus. It's amazing thing to me that the people in Jesus' day who gave him the most conflict were not the publicans and the sinners, but it was the church going people. And I wonder if the Lord were to return for a visit today, if he would not be more comfortable with the sinners and publicans than he would at most churches. But in these two chapters, chapter 7 and chapter 8, there are numerous charges and accusations made against the Lord, and He answers each one of them. And the longer the encounter goes, the more offensive the accusations, the more heated their side of the argument becomes. They question His credentials, they dismiss His claims to be the Son of God, they... Um, they make moves to arrest him. In fact, in the last verse of chapter 8, they have stones in their hands, ready, ready to stone him. It's an amazing statement in verse 359 where it says, They took the up stones to cast at Jesus, but Jesus hid himself. Hid himself. He doesn't hide himself because he is afraid of them or afraid of death. But he hides himself because it is not yet his time. And I just tried to picture that in my mind. My mind, there is the Lord Jesus hiding behind the wall, uh, in a secret closet, but he's hiding till they leave so he can leave. Jesus hid himself. And what has angered him so much is not just what he said about himself, but what he has said about not only has he made claims to be the Son of God, he has exposed them for who they truly are. If you were to go back to this chapter, the times that we have looked at it, he has said that, that you don't know God, that you are servants to sin, you are in bondage to the lust of your flesh, that you are going to die in your sins, that you are not the true children of Abraham. That's what he has said to him in this chapter. And that last charge, I think, really struck a nerve with them because uh, they, they were very vocal about defending their lineage to Abraham. You see, Abraham was the father of the nation of Israel, and they believed that just being a son of Abraham made them a son of God. They believed that they were the children of God just by natural birth, by their natural ancestry as the children of Abraham. And so there becomes a back and forth in this chapter about father, who your real father is. You look in verse number 38. He says, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. I have a father, and you have a father. And we both speak and do what we have heard with our Father. And I have a different Father than what you have. See that? Verse 39, they answered, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our Father. Jesus said unto him, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham, if you were truly the sons of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham, like father, like son. But you are nothing like Abraham. Huh. Verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then they say to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, he would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he that sent me. You claim God as your father, just like you claim Abraham as your father. But if God were your father, you'd love me. You're nothing like Abraham, and you are nothing like God. 
to me that if I have more God, there's no problem. So there's a conversation about Father. There's a very common misconception in this world that all children are the children of God. Or the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. That we are all God's children. It doesn't matter what you believe, what religion you follow. It doesn't matter Hindu, Buddhist, Catholic, Baptist. That we are all the children of God. You won't find that in the Bible. God is our creator. But he is not all men's father. What Jesus is saying is that just because you can trace your family line back to Abraham doesn't mean that God in heaven is your father. What if Abraham's not your father? If God's not your father, then who is your father? Who's going to answer in verse number 44? You're of your father, but dead. And the lust of your father, you will do. He's a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And he speaketh a lie. He speaketh of his own. But he is a liar and the father of him. I just want to preach that one verse, that one verse this morning, and then we'll, we'll move on because we've been several weeks in chapter 8. And I just want to just emphasize that one verse that I want to preach on is the devil your devil. Is the devil your daddy? Imagine the horror. So he needs people to hear that your daddy is the devil. That's what he said, eh? He said, you just like him. You are more like the devil than you are God, so we conclude that he's your daddy. Your work, your spirit, your attitude, your hatred of Christ, your unbelief, all points to who your true Father is, and it is the devil. It has become a popular thing in our day to trace your ancestry back as far as you can. Some of y'all may have done that, ancestry.com or whatever it might be. And you would do that because it would be interesting to know if you were the great, 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 great grandson of George Washington or Benjamin Franklin or somebody famous. How would you like to discover that you have somebody famous in your family tree all the way down? Now, that would be significant to you, but it wouldn't add anything to your life. It would make you a bit, I don't know how good it would help you, but anyway. Again, maybe you don't want to know. Maybe you're afraid that all this back there are Hatfields and McCoys and some con man, and I, I really just, I, I just don't want to know. Who is on that family tree? But everybody has a family, right? Everybody has a family. And if you ran, if you ran your ancestry back far enough, and I ran my ancestry back far enough, somewhere you and I are going to meet in several weeks in the same tree. You're going to discover that we are related somehow. Every man in here, every man in here goes back to Adam. We are all one family in the flesh. But Jesus is speaking of a spiritual family here. You are either in the family of God or you are in the family of Satan. Now, you can go out on the street, you can ask a hundred people, which family are you in? And 99 of them are going to say that I am in the family of God. But that's not exactly how Jesus thought. And we would have understood it. We would have understood it if Jesus had gone to the bar and the dive in the honky tonk and, and told them that the devil is your daddy. But Jesus is looking at the super pious, the extra religious, the ultra spiritual Pharisees and hypocrites. They dedicated their lives to a strict adherence of the law. In fact, the law wasn't even strict enough for them, so they had to add some extra stipulations and rules just to make it really hard. And these men would tell you that they are spiritual. There's no humility in them that these men are the great papers of the great papers of the kingdom. And Jesus looked at them and said, The devil is your devil. Well, that's not very nice. Or would you have He looks at and points his finger at and says, You're of your father. Maybe we should talk about the devil. We talk about the devil and I'm coming. Number one, number one, 
the certainty of the truth. There is a religion called Christian science. It is neither Christian nor science. They claim that they believe in the existence of a devil, but it's not a person. It is just evil is what it is. But Jesus speaks of the devil as a real being. Mark this down. He is not an impersonal force. It is not just the personification of evil. He, 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 is, he is a fallen angelic being. He was created perfect in all of his ways. He was the anointed cherub of heaven. He was created with beauty and power and great wisdom, but he became lifted up in his heart because of pride. And because of pride, he wanted the worship that was due to God alone, and as a consequence, he was cast out of heaven. Now, rarely do we ever come to church to talk about the devil. We come to talk about the Lord Jesus and about God. But there are two extremes when you think about the devil. There are some people who are so fascinated with the devil and the spirit world that their entire ministry is a demon-fighting ministry. I think I mentioned this when I was preaching through for Peter 5 and talking about the sober division because their adversary, the devil, walked about and roaring lives. And there are some people that they emphasize the spiritual warfare, and we might not want to emphasize it more, but you can go to feed on anything and you spend so much time looking for the devil that you don't have time looking for Jesus. So I've never gotten involved in all of that. I, I really would emphasize truth instead of error, emphasize Jesus instead of the devil. So there are some that see a demon behind every tree. However, there are others that go to the other extreme and they live as if there is not a devil. Play them with sin and temptation in the world as if the devil does not exist. And the spirit world is a realm that, that we know we know very little about. The, the Bible gives us a little bit of insight, but it doesn't give us a whole lot. But it does give us enough information to know that there is a devil. He is a dangerous enemy, and he is out to destroy your life. And we shouldn't get up every day and think about the devil and look for the devil, but be aware of the devil and his devices. The Bible says that we are not ignorant of his devices. First Peter five is it, is it seven or eight? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as they were as they were and I walked about seeking whom he may devour. That, 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 that is the devil. Can I tell you that Satan is actively on the prowl right now, looking for lies that he can destroy. The devil pretends to be your friend, but he is your enemy. He hates Jesus Christ. He hates the nation of Israel. He hates the church. He hates the family. The devil tears up marriages, and the devil causes division in a church, and he, and he, and he seduces church members with, with, with false doctrine and, and worldly living, and he disguises himself as an angel of life, and he seeks to influence the church through his emissaries to try to destroy us. And the devil hates you, and I hate the devil. And you ought to hate him as well. And so I've Peter 5 says, be sober. Be sober. To be sober is to be serious mind. And I think that you and I need to be serious of mind and about living for Jesus. Now don't be asleep to the temptations of life. Be sober, be vigilant, be, be, be watchful, your surroundings, the temptations, the things that the devil is throwing at you. He says in that passage, when you resist, steadfast in the faith. You fight a good warfare by having a strong faith and having a good conscience toward God. But the Bible never tells you, the Bible never tells you to bind Satan. But it also doesn't tell you to, it, it, it doesn't tell you to bind Satan. It doesn't tell you to run from Satan. It tells you to stand in the truth and be firm in Christ, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We don't run from the devil, but I don't go looking for the devil. You just stand in truth. And all of us, all of us this morning are fodder for the devil without the help of God. You are no match for the devil, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I feel like preaching just a little bit if you wanted to hear it. Amen. 
The devil is real, and he's out to destroy your life, but I'm grateful that there's somebody inside of me that is greater than the devil. And Satan should have no foothold in your family. I don't want him to get my children or my grandchildren. I don't want him to mess up our church. I don't want him to destroy any marriages, and so we're not ignorant of his devices. The certainty of the devil. But then in our text, I want to say a word about the character of the devil. Lord Jesus really exposes you. That's what Jesus says about him in verse 4. He says, You're of your father, the devil, the lust of your father, he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's a murderer from the beginning. Now, what constitutes murder? You say taking another person's life. No, 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 that's too broad. You can take somebody's life and stuff with them. Government can take somebody's life and capital to punish them. You may have to take somebody's life in war, and that's not murder. See, here's what murder is. Murder is taking another human life without divine warning. Taking another human life without divine warning. And Jesus said that the devil was a murderer from the beginning. So I'm wondering how was he a murderer? Because you know what the beginning of the first week, we're going back to Genesis chapter 3, yeah? In fact, in fact, turn back to it just, just for a minute. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, where Satan held his first interaction with the human race, he, he comes to Eve as a beautiful serpent. But he didn't bite her and inject her body with poison. He didn't come with a weapon and chop her up with a sword or stomp her to the ground. He didn't do that. Here's what he did. He talked to her. But everything that he told her was a lie. And that's the second characteristic of the devil in our country. He's a liar. He is murder, choice, is a lie. He does more death and destruction with a lie than anything else. And that's what Jesus tells us. He tells us that his motive is murder, his method is to lie. The devil wants to bring death to you, he wants to bring death to life, to purity, to happiness, to joy. To holiness. He wants to bring physical death and soulless death and spiritual death and eternal death and the second death and death on the lake of fire. He wants to bring death. And the way that he does that is he does it through a life. Suppose Satan had come to you and just said, I am going to be perfectly honest with you. I don't want you to take this forbidden fruit because it will damn your soul to hell. And it will plunge the entire human race. I, 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 I hate you. I hate God. And I want you to take this through because I know of the crime and the disease and the heartbreak that it's going to cause to the world. I want to curse the world. And I need you to take this through so I can do that. He would never talk to you. But he lied. Look at the finish. Are, are you going to finish the three videos? It gives you a little, little, little outline here. Look, look at verse number one. The serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made, and he said, He said to the Lord, you to underline that word, He said unto the woman. Look at verse two. And the woman said unto the serpent. Look at verse four. And the serpent said unto the woman. Here's the first thing that you have in Genesis 3. You have a dialogue talking about. The devil wants to talk. And the first thing he does is he engages Eve in a conversation. Here's what's happening. They are having a dialogue about what God has said. What God said is now up for discussion. Opinions are being offered on what God said. Now here's my question for you. What business does Eve have and getting into a dialogue with the devil. 
Her, her first mistake was in arguing with the devil over what God has said. The best thing that she could have done is said, God said it, and leave it right there. We're not having the conversation. By the way, isn't that what Jesus did when the devil came to tempt him? The devil came to tempt him, and here's what Jesus said. It is written. It is written. It is written. We're not talking about it. It is written. It is written. This is what God has said. You will have people in your life who will want to question everything that you believe. You will have court members knock on your door and they want to have a Bible study. They don't have a Bible study. They want to debate about what God has said. You will have preachers on the radio and the television and they'll try to cause the discussion about what God has said. And the best thing is to not have the conversation. Don't start the dialogue. The dialogue going on. But we're looking for some more. Here's what he said. Yay, have God the dialogue opens up to doubt. And I can almost hear the fear in his voice. It's happened. He doesn't come right out and call God a liar, but he drops the hint. He makes the suggestion that maybe God hadn't told you everything. But maybe God is leaving something out. Here's what he does. He puts a question mark on the Word of God. Are you sure you heard that correctly? Are you, are you sure that's just not, that's just not his interpretation? Maybe, maybe, maybe he didn't say what you thought he said. Yeah, that's not the, the first lie the devil tells us on God. He smears the character of God because he gets you thinking negatively about God. He's got you. So there's a dialogue and there's doubt. But then look in verse number three. The woman said unto the shepherd, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But verse three, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye stop. Now we have denial. By the way, in verse number in verse number three, neither shall ye touch it. God didn't say that. Now we are adding to the God, Word of God. But in verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely stop. He has conditioned her mind to trust in the Word of God. So that when you openly despise God, He is conditioned to accept it. He has just boldly called God a liar. This is what God said to you, but He lied to you. He tells us that you can sin without Impunity. The wage of the sin is not the sin. I tell you that the devil is a liar. He's a liar. Denial. Look in verse number five. For God doth know that in the day he eat thereof, in your eyes shall be open, and he shall be of God's knowing good and evil. Now we have delusion. He slanders God by telling Eve that God is trying to keep something good away from you. He knows the good that will happen. He knows what you'll be like if you eat that fruit. So God has forbidden you so He can keep you down. God doesn't want the best for you. It's just His way of depriving you of what you... You think the devil still tells that lie? Oh, He's still telling that lie. You, you know what's best for you. You're your parents are just trying to keep you down. You need to express yourself. You, you know how you want to live your life. They shouldn't be able to tell you what you can't do. Do you need to lie? God still tell the same lie. He has deceived these into thinking that she can live her life independent of God. I'm going to liberate you. Uh, we're, we're going to have true liberty. You can make your own choices. You decide which fruit you can eat and which you cannot eat. And the devil has told that lie. To millions and millions of people, he's deluded men and women to thinking that you can live your life apart from God. And the devil is not trying to get Eve to be a devil. He just wants to be your own person. He just makes you own decisions. Look, the devil, the, the devil is not so much concerned that he gets you drunk. Or that he gets you committing some fornication or some gross sin of the flesh. 
He is not disappointed that you're not a doper or that you're not a street walker. Here's what he'd like for you to do. He'd like for you to put on a nice suit, put a Bible under your heart, come to a Baptist church, sit in a pew, and be your own man. Have a little religion, but live your life without God. Look at verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. That was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She has bought the lie, and her desires have been perverted. Because for the first time now, she desires what God has forbidden. God will take, the devil will take a God-given desire in your heart and he will pervert it so that it becomes a perversion. The desire for food is natural. Gluttony is a perversion of that. The desire for, for provision is natural. But covetousness and greed is a perversion of that desire. That's exactly what he's done. Now look at her decision. In verse he took of the fruit thereof and did now, later on, he's going to say that the devil made me do it. But he didn't. The decision is her own decision. The devil deceives her, but the decision is squarely on her shoulders. He's going to pay the price for this. And can I tell you, there are not enough demons in hell to make you sin a cause you to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. If the devil can make you deny Jesus, he'd make us all deny Jesus. And the reason why he doesn't is because he cannot. God gave you a will. You can say yes, or you can say no. I'll give an invitation in just a few minutes, and, and I'll invite sinners to come and trust the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And the devil will give you a thousand and one excuses why you ought not to. That's all that he can do. He can stop you from coming. On the other hand, I'm praying, as he sang this little bit ago, I'm praying the Holy Spirit will convict somebody's heart and convince you that what I am preaching this morning is the absolute truth. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will speak to you and convict you of your sin and invite you to come to Jesus. And if He does that, that would be a wonderful thing. But He's not going to force you down there. It is your decision. There are not enough demons in hell to keep you from touching Christ as your Savior, and there are, not, there are not enough angels in heaven to force you down the aisle. God gives you a choice. You can say yes or no. And he has made a choice, and her spirit choice bound her to her spirit. Now, I, I, I have a good deal from the passage, and I, 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 I'm getting off track, all right? But, but do you see that he's alive? Do you see that? That's what I'm trying to say. He's alive. And he lied to Eve and to the entire human race through his mind. And here's what Jesus said about him. Jesus said that when he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, watch this, and the father of it. So in John chapter 8, Jesus doubles down on the lies of the devil. He is a liar and the father of it. I know this is not shouting for Sunday morning. I understand that, all right? But, but it, is, it, it, it is the text. We live in a world where lying is more natural to people than telling the truth. That people would just as soon tell a lie as they would tell the truth. It becomes natural. Can, can I show you a verse? Can I show you a verse? Go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, all right? Revelation 21. And, and look at the verse here. Revelation chapter 21. And I, I just, I just, this is just the direction we need to go. But Revelation 21, look at verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brings home with Jesus the second day. A liar is next door to the sorcerer and the whoremonger. And they're all neighbors in hell. And since Satan is the father of lies, when you lie, you become like Satan. But, but, but let me show you where we're at. Let me show you where we're at. Turn the page. Turn the page. Chapter 22. Let me show you where we're at. Look at verse 15. Pull it out. Pull it out of the city. Pull it out. Our dogs, the sorcerers, the whoremongers, the murderers, and idolaters. 
And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. We live in a society that loves the lies that they are told. We live in a society where they would rather you tell them a lie than tell them the truth. Isn't that amazing thing? Say, why is that? Because Second Thessalonians 2. The Bible says, for this cause, God should send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. In the last days, God will send a spirit of delusion that people will accept a lie. Four times in the Old Testament, the Bible says that God put a lying spirit in the heart of a false prophet. And that's what we are facing today. We are living in a land of a lying spirit, strong delusion, where people would rather you lie to them than tell them the truth. The, the news media is a lying spirit. Politicians, that is a lying spirit. There is a lot of lying going on. Most of what you hear in this world is a lie. And it's curious to me, it's curious to me that out of all of God's creatures, only humans lie. They don't study for animals to do things like hide the food. I mean, good part of it. That's not real honest. But they don't lie. They don't lie. But only humans, only humans lie. And lying is they can. That, that's, why, that's why, thank God, my childhood days are done. But that's why, when you're raising children, you don't have to have many rules. One of them better be. We don't lie. We tell the truth. If you come down hard anything, you come down on them. You don't have to have a lot of rules to raise kids. But one rule is, we don't lie in this house. Because when you lie, you are in fellowship with the devil. And let me just say this right here. Let me just say this right here. I'm trying to find a quick one. Right? You pray for me. I believe that when you get saved, I believe that one of the things that the Holy Spirit will clean up is the lying. I believe that. God is the author of truth. Jesus is the way to truth and life. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, John said. The Word is the Word of truth. That's a whole lot of truth. And there's just too much truth in the Godhead to conceive of one of God's children that can't tell the truth. If, if, God, if, if God is your Father, you share in His nature, and His nature is true. But the Bible says that we are partakers of the divine nature. You share in His nature, and His nature is true. So if you are not a partaker of the divine nature, then whose nature do you have? He was going to be a partaker of the divine nature. The only way for you to have somebody's nature is it is to have a divine father. If you don't have a divine father, then who is your father? That's what Jesus said, John chapter 1. He said that the devil is your I, I, I hate to talk about I really do. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, but this is it, it, what I believe. If you are a new creature in Christ, you heard, heard that right? If old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. How come that does not include lying? And I know that sanctification is a process. I know you're not perfect the day after you got saved. There are some of you that used to test before you got saved, and it took you a little while to get all that testing out of your system because it's just so natural. There were some of y'all that used to smoke before you got saved, and you smoked a little bit after you got saved, but eventually you quit. Some of y'all used to listen to country music and pop music before you got saved, but if you got saved, then you eventually are going to quit listening to that. Because here's what happens. Here's what happens. What happens the Holy Spirit begins to convict you, and the conviction is not worth the custom, so you quit the custom. And the Holy Spirit convicts you, and the conviction is not worth the smoking, so you quit the smoking. Can I help you now? And, and then the Holy Spirit convicts you, and the conviction is not worth the country music, so you quit the country music, and you just, you just quit what you do. And if you're still a big liar now, as you were 20 years ago when you got saved, that ought to be a test of your salvation. 
or at least the test of your sanctity. And it doesn't mean that you will never lie again. It doesn't mean that you won't ever be careless with some facts. It doesn't mean that you are not ever forgetful and say things that you didn't know or you forgot or whatever it might be. That's a character flaw that needs to be cleaned up. But I am talking about the spirit of lying. And the spirit of lying is when you intentionally tell a lie or deceive somebody else for ulterior motives. And if you have that spirit of lying, you have to ask, where is the Holy Spirit inside of me? Does that make sense? Telling you what is in the well is going to come up in the middle. The tree only produces after its time. Children of the devil deal in life. Children of God deal in faith. You deal in lies, you are doing what your daddy can do. And by the way, the people Jesus is talking to are. Church going, clean living, high giving people. They read the Bible, they pray, they fast, they give on in Jesus' name. The big thing. The daddy of the devil. The cause of the night. And I'm asked, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? First John. First John talks about those who say that they worship God and they walk in the darkness. Here's what John says. He says they lie and do not speak. They lie and don't. But then, a couple of verses later, John says that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There are some people that tell a lie to others so long that they eventually believe their own lie. There are some people that know they ain't spiritual. They know they're carnal as a ghost, and they'll tell you that. Well, there are other people that are carnal as a ghost and, 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 and don't have an ounce of God in them, but yet they have convinced themselves that they are spiritual with all of their carnality. But then, in John, 1 John 1, that next step was, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, him a liar, and his word is not us. We, we, we lie to God. Lie to God. God, I didn't do that. God, God I, I'm not that bad. When God can just give your sin, you resist. You're telling God, you got the wrong man, you lie. Let me say something. Say something. All right, I'm going to come to the point. I've got to let it be done. And I, I won't even get to the rest of it. Let me say something. You didn't get to choose your earthly father. You were born as you were born to, and there was nothing you could do. You can just buy one another. You can just own one another. You can, a parent and father can give up parental rights. I guess the child can, can say, I don't want you to be my father. Change his name, whatever it might be. But in the flesh, your father is your father, and there's nothing you can do about it. You cannot help the family that you were born into physically or spiritually. You were born into a family of Satan. Here's good news. You don't have to stay in the family. You don't have to stay in the family. I'm telling you, God is my Father, and His arms are open wide, and He says, Welcome in my family. Only God, only God can do that. Take you from one family and put you in another family. Sometimes when I'm traveling, I watch some YouTube videos, and I've gotten into this thing of watching court cases, paternity cases, child custody cases. I don't know why. It keeps me away from the little night driving trying to get there. But here's what I find. Here's what I find. Hang on to it. I, I'm, I'm done. That judge, that judge, when they stand before him, that judge has the right to determine the penalty of that judge can take a child out of a home and put that child in a foster home. Not a permanent solution, but it's temporary for the safety of the child. The child, the judge can deem one parent unfit and give all of the rights to the other parent. The third judge can determine neither parent is fit and give the rights to somebody else outside the family. It could be in a situation of an adoption. 
where if all the parties agree, the judge can legally declare that this child is no longer your child, but this child is legally belong to another family, change the name, all of the rights. The judge has the power to do all of that. But here's what I've yet to see a judge do. It's take the child into his own family. He's never taken the child. He said, I want you to be my child. I'm, I'm a, I am going to assume all of the responsibility for all the provisions and all the care. I'm going to give you my name. You've never done that. He's always assigned parental rights to somebody else, but he's never brought him into his own family. On the head, it was a day, it was a day, it was a day. When God on earth, God on earth, he reached out and took me out of the family of the devil and put me in his family, made me his son, made me his child, gave me his name, took on my care in the responsibility of it. What a father, what a father. 